Today is May 15th, 2017. You're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 42. We're covering this week's stories, including various advances in health human factors, a sensor that turns your dumb home into a smart home, as well as our favorite things from Kai 2017. I got nothing witty to say, because Human Factors Cast starts right now. to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Elise Hallett. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. What is going on? Elise, are you trying to take over my show here? No, I just, I got really, really excited when I heard that I could come guest star on your show. Oh, man. Well, anyway, I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnstorff is here. Sorry for all that confusion, <laughs> folks, but good <laughs> evening. And we also have Elise Hallett. Hello, everyone. All right. So, obviously, we have a guest on the show this week. We thought it'd be fun to switch it up. Um, so, Elise is a human factors engineer and a lecturer at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, Elise, just to catch our listeners up kind of with you and what you're doing, why don't you just go over your interests and tell us a little bit about some of the stuff you're currently working on? Well, that is a great question because my interests are very varied. Um, I've done research in the domain of accessibility, looking at technology that visual impaired students have used to interact with computers. I have done research in healthcare, um, specifically with robotic surgery and looking at like a systems of systems approach and accounting for this new technology in the operating room. And um, right now I'm actually doing a primarily focused on task analyses on how Navy operators are doing their daily tasks and some of the tools that they're using um, to incorporate some new solutions. So kind of varied, but um, keeps me occupied. Well, excellent. Well, I'm glad you're on the show this week. Uh, you're going to provide some excellent commentary uh, and uh, pick up the slack where Blake and I uh, can't, can't quite pick up the slack. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying. It's a Monday. I'm really tired. <laughs> uh, so HFES this year, we're going. Um, for our listeners, if you're going, stop by, say hi. Uh, do you have anything interesting this week, Blake, for banter? Or uh, should we just jump um, in? So I have kind of a, a little bit of an announcement on, for me anyway. Ooh. So I am now the UXPA marketing director here for the LA chapter of UXPA. So for you, people who don't know, it's a, like a user experience group of professional. It's like the user experience professional association, it's LA chapter. And I've helped them do their marketing, kind of expand their, their reach and all that kind of stuff. Um, but other than that, Kind of just hanging out, stuck for some news, man. So wait, is that is that title marketing director? Yeah, oh, director man. of marketing, marketing director. Yes, I'm I'm jealous. Do you get to wear like the white cape, like Director Krennic from Star Wars? I so wish that I did, but I don't think I do. It's not part of the job, but you still can wear it anyway, right? Oh uh, yeah, and okay. I will. All right, all right, cool, cool, cool. As as long as that's as long as that's taken care of, then we're good. All right, well. Director Arnsdorf. Uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and move on. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get into the news. So this is this part of the show all about human factors news. Now this could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, artificial intelligence, whatever it is, automation, you name it. As long as it has to do with the field of human factors, it's fair game. Blake, what do we have up first? All right. So first off, let's just thank all of our friends at the IEEE Spectrum Wired TechCrunch in the uh, in gadget science daily hellenic shipping news and the next web for bringing us the stories for this week you can as always follow us on social media for the links to the original articles and we're kicking it off with the port authority of london so this week the port authority of london better known as the pla launched its latest safety campaign focused on the human factor at its at its annual stakeholder forum last tuesday The PLA decided to target human error after analysis of incident data showed that it was the leading cause of navigational incidents on the tidal Thames in the last two years. It drew on maritime and Coast Guard agency guidance highlighting the deadly zones, highlighting the deadly zones, the 12 top factors relating to relating to people. So the deadly dozen is actually a clever mnemonic of human factors. Now, this was no surprise to me that human error plays a big role in things like merit, 
the maritime industry, or I guess in this case, in the River Thames. What did you guys think of this one? Well, for us, yeah, it's 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 uh, pretty pretty uh, duh, right? But but for other people who have no idea why humans are making all these mistakes, it could be uh, very enlightening. But really quick, I want to get your thoughts on this, Elise. But before we do, um, I want to go over this. So you mentioned it's a clever mnemonic for human factors. And basically the way it breaks down is habits, unity, mindfulness, attentiveness, notifying, so human, uh, factors is fitness for duty, ability, communication, tensions, overtired, routine, and safety culture. I thought it was cool. I, I, I mean, you know, it, they go into this and they, they kind of break it down in, in terms of these questions for the human operator. Um, and it's definitely a mnemonic that... Uh, I don't know if it was needed or not, but <laughs> certainly, certainly uh, uh, something useful for sure. At least you, what did you have think to th- think about why you're, you know, navigating a ship, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So at least what did you think on this one? Um, I thought that some of the the attributes that they tied in was interesting. I mean, to us with the human factors background, some of these things like like communication and routine, um, they, they're kind of key things that we look out for. But I think there are aspects that not a lot of people consider, especially as you get used to this job that you're doing over and over and over again. And when you hear about these human errors in the media, you hear like, oh, they were tired. You know, how how could that person be tired? Why were they tired? And it's, you know, for us, it's this red alarm. So it's it's an interesting approach, I think, and some of these aspects that they call out. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, not really much more to say about this one other than cool mnemonic. Uh, go, go check out the... London Port Authority. If you wanna, if you wanna check out that mnemonic, uh, like Blake said, we also post all the links to our articles on all of our social media. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? All right, so up next, Oscar Widegren is an 18-year-old athlete from Stockholm and f- is fully visually impaired since he was the age of five. Oscar participated in a project called the Impossible Run. It's the world's first experiment made together with the small Swedish sound designer company Lexter. Design, they designed to challenge the idea that blind runners always need a physical person to run with. After planning and training together for almost two years, the technology was tested for the very first time, and Oscar was able was the first man out proving that the technology actually works. This technology really has the potential to be a game changer for visually impaired athletes, a new paradigm where technology plays a role in making sports more accessible to everyone. For more information about the project, you can check them out on the impossible run.com. Now this, I, I thought this experiment was pretty crazy because you're basically, they used sound to help direct somebody who is totally blind, be able to run in a clear path. Right, right. The, uh, the technology, by the way, is called hyper-directional sound. Um, and basically, it, uh, it, it emits sound in narrow beams, right? And, and um, kind of like a flashlight controls a ray of light. Uh, hyper-directional sound directs the sound in sharp lines, so it's only audible for the people that you point it at. And we, we actually have a story on this for coming out of Kai a little bit later um, on this very thing but um but yeah it it almost works like echolocation where it gives their inner ear uh a visual of an invisible sound barrier like if you're looking at this uh, article it kind of it kind of illustrates it that it's like a lane um i i don't know how to describe it they're going down a lane and they have two sounds coming out of either side and if they get close to either side i guess maybe this guy will hear it at least what did you think of this one well i thought it was just fascinating i mean working with students who are visually impaired and hearing about the challenges they face just doing the basic things hearing about now we have technology that allows people who are blind to run on their own is it's just amazing to me yeah and i mean i worked on a project a little bit uh a couple years ago um about like visual soundscapes and how how you can help blind people navigate the web and it's just it's the accessibility aspect of this is just amazing. We are, I, I mean, we did it with glasses. Now people who couldn't see can see. Now people who couldn't or who can't see at all can now run uh, with assistance of technology. And I think, you know, um, it, it, there's a lot to be said for that. I, I, mm-hmm. I fully appreciate that as someone who is visually impaired. 
uh, at yeah, least I've slightly. Yeah, I've seen some of this technology come out where people who are completely blind will have this, this um, uh, sensor on their chest that they wear. And it'll help them navigate around certain buildings, you know, so not just with dogs, but with these sensors that they're wearing, they can navigate to places. It's it's just amazing. Yeah. Blake, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, some of this blind technology on the show before with like haptic feedback. What do you think about this one? So I think this is really a cool thing because uh, as much as like I had never really thought about it before, like, it's got to be very tough for visually impaired athletes to like get workouts in and stuff like that and i mean they basically are using sound as just a visual to basically give you the lanes if you think of like a running track at high school well when i was looking at this i was like i was wondering okay how could you apply this like in in a gym rack where you're trying to like lift weights or anything like that and so i I feel like there's just far-reaching implications for this to give those that are visually impaired especially if they're fully blind a better idea of where things are in relation to them in visual space. Cause I mean, if you're lifting heavy weight, you don't want to be dropping it on yourself, but you also want to be able to be safe and get out from under it if it was on top of you. So I feel like sound technology like this, that directs it and is very specific to, to each user, like the article said is only going to get cooler. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they're going to adapt this technology to help, um, uh, to, to help with the long jump, I think is the next test, but, but yeah, it's definitely cool to see, uh, application to get them more active too. That's that's uh, that's definitely the coolest part, I think. All right, so are we ready to jump into Kai? Because there, <laughs> there was a lot of stuff coming out of Kai. Oh, here we go. So yeah, I think we are. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. All right. So the Kai conference on human factors in computing systems took place in Denver last week, and just like last year, it's hosted some amazing, incredible, and utterly bizarre technology demos. This year, the theme was explore, innovate inspire which as far as we can tell has no specific meaning and therefore does not constrain the weirdness that kai is so well known for and you will see that in a moment the ieee spectrum has gone through hundreds of 30 second video clips to find the most interesting and craziest stuff with respect to interface devices including project telepathy desk wave air vortex rings and a few more that we'll walk through for you guys yeah do we do we just want to go through these kind of one by one and talk about them a little bit and then uh break them down nick i I think we have to some of these are so out there it really is all right let's do it okay so the first one up we have project telepathy now this is kind of like what we were talking about before with these uh these audio signals that are that are uh, directional, I guess. So, like, you could send a signal down a beam of light, kind of like a laser pointer, but with sound. And um, <laughs> so, this the group of researchers from uh, University of Bristol they came up with this uh, project telepathy, where <laughs> it's basically some guy <laughs> with this apparatus on his mouth, and uh, he's able to whisper to another he- uh, another person halfway across the room without somebody else um, <laughs> somebody else hearing. <laughs> and just to reiterate the fact that he has electrodes like basically <laughs> plastered all over his mouth is <laughs> like, just this is insane not practical in the least but oh my gosh is it entertaining to look at uh, it's, like... it's pretty insane because it's literally directing where the sound goes and in, in the instance in the video it's kind of like a guy saying danger when somebody's walking towards steps but he's not yelling it he just whispers it and it gets the person's attention i think it's pretty insane right uh elise any thoughts on this one (laughs) the first thought that came to mind is that it's something that i feel like a parent would love to take advantage of (laughs) because you don't ever want to be that parent in a in a quiet place that's screaming at their child (laughs) that is a wonderful idea i think uh this would be an amazing thing for parents uh i know i would be appreciative of it uh because i like my silence when i'm out in public uh all right let's move on to this next one so it's desk wave this is desktop interactions using low-cost microwave doppler arrays this is uh this is basically making a desk interactive through these um through these sensors and i i think there's a lot of uh, uh, like I want this on my desk. Yeah, the the thing I thought about when I saw this because I kind I kind of laugh like because in this instance it's it's for the desk and it's connected to being able to kind of make interactions on your computer happen. 
But last week we talked about basically a spray that would do something similar. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and I think so, that, that was presented uh, uh, yeah. at Kai as well. Exactly. Yeah. And so when we talked about that last time, we were kind of throwing around the implication that this could be used in a smart house. Well, I thought this was a, had like a similar application. And I don't know if it's if it'd be any because it says it's low cost and it's just microwaves. I mean, the danger being you've got microwaves now amplified in your house to make things more interactive. Um, but it's a it's a pretty cool design. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you get the resolution that the other project did because uh, it looks like you know it's um, well, I, who can tell what the resolution is? But it looks like a checkerboard underneath, and so. I don't know. It seems like it has pretty fine resolution, but that would be one of my concerns. Uh, what do you think, Elise? Any thoughts on this one? Uh, well, I mean, it's it's an interesting idea. I know that the interactive desk is has been an idea. It's been around for a while, especially in cases where you know, like doctors are explaining stuff to patients, and you know, it provides a, a more common ground between the two. It's a little hard for an office. I personally keep far too many papers on it to <laughs> to oh, make know. this very useful for me. <laughs> okay, can we move on to my absolute favorite one of the interfaces? <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> this one's so cool. <laughs> uh, so this is haptic perception uh, uh, air vortex. What do they call this thing? I don't even know what they call this. It's like they're just looking at haptic perception uh in response to air vortex rings. It's essentially like, um, it's like a, it's like a haptic alert, but with smoke rings. So this woman is sitting at her computer. The video has this woman sitting at her computer and, uh, she gets a notification and there's a puff of smoke that blows her in the face and she's suddenly surprised. <laughs> and then, the, then it goes on. She's, a, she's awake and then she gets the puff of smoke and suddenly she's asleep. It's amazing. <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> First thing I thought it was like, I'm getting one of these if it'll put you to sleep that quickly. Oh my God. That's <laughs> right? I think it was for dramatic effect, but it's still, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, this one's probably the most goofiest, I I think. I mean, I mm, something so subtle for haptic, hapt, haptic feedback. Wow. Uh, I mean, I guess if you're just browsing, but... Uh, I don't really have a whole lot of thoughts on this one other than it looks like it could be fun to play around with. Fun to watch. <laughs> Someone else <laughs> more fun, it. More fun to watch for sure. <laughs> All right. We got a lot of these. What do we got up next is, uh, hey, wake up. It's called uh, come along with the artificial learning companion to the e-learning, e-learners outcomes high. And this is, uh, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Um, it's like your little it's a little companion for people that are it, like a small tiny little electronic robot guy that basically is a small has a really small screen that's his face and based on how well you're paying attention this is for like kids that are taking online courses um based on how well you're paying attention his face will change um and if and According to this study, they have a large problem with, like, I guess, students in online classes falling asleep or not being engaged in the material. So let's say you were to fall asleep while your little, uh, I can't remember his <laughs> name specifically, but if you fall asleep, he gets really angry, his face turns red, and he makes an alarm noise until you wake up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I remember it's now. It's kind of cool that it's actually, I guess, paying attention to, uh, like, what you're doing and then trying to give you some some kind of stimulation whether good or bad based on if you're paying attention to the material or doing your work uh, but still a very goofy ro little robot you teach classes elise is this needed <laughs> uh well for a lot of these online courses it's it's hard to see exactly how much they're interacting but i'm sure with some of my lectures they'd probably gain gain benefit from this <laughs> yes all right well Make it a requirement for all your students. All right. Uh, CETO, an actuated smart mo smartwatch, smart watch, uh, for extended <laughs> interaction. <laughs> for extended interaction. We're professional here. Uh, so this one, I love this because it's straight out of a James Bond movie. This guy is like having a bunch of trouble looking at his watch. And I have that problem all the time. And it's basically a watch <laughs> on a track that adjusts so it sees your face. And so like if you're carrying something, the watch will adjust so that way the face is on, on uh, the back of your uh, wrist. And then if you're like washing dishes or something, 
and it's uh, up your sleeve. Presumably, it will shoot out of your sleeve, so that way you can see it. Uh, I love this idea. I don't know how practical it's going to be with all the mechanical bits and pieces going around with it, but it's definitely something that I want because it looks like a James Bond movie. <laughs> you know, Nick, I don't think, like, this is definitely, like, they say it's a high fidelity proof of concept, but there is a lot of hardware involved with their prototype. But I don't think something like this is really out of the range of being real because they bring up valid concerns. Like, with the guy washing the dishes, and he's got a smartwatch on and can't see it, doesn't want to touch it. I mean, something like this would work, but if it was a little less cumbersome in terms of hardware, I don't know. It could catch on. Yeah. No, I see if it gets small and if the if the hardware gets small enough and, and um, you know, not cumbersome enough. What is it? Lack of cumbersome? What? I can't wait. Anti-cumbersome. Anti-cumbersome. There we go. That that works. At least you have need of one of these? <laughs> Definitely, especially when coming out of the grocery store. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, that's a great one. Um all right, so Sparkle, hover feedback with touchable electric arc. This is um, this to me kind of looks like a uh, a capacitive touchscreen, but with electricity. So like you can hover, and it basically uh, completes the circuit with your finger. Uh, I'd imagine it works in in a very similar way to capacitive touchscreens. Um, just another way of interacting. I'm going to speed up a couple of these because. Um, we got so many to cover here. Uh, let's see. What do we got up next is breath screen. This one is basically a uh, – and, and please stop me if you have any thoughts on these. I'm just going to kind of run through these. Um, but breath screen is a – oh, it looks like an e-cigarette that you blow out of and it projects a TV show on it. <laughs> Yeah, it just projects like an image. I encourage listeners to watch the video and look for the scary cat image that it posts up. That's about all I've got on that one. Hang on, did I miss that? I watched all these videos, and I'm like, trying, where's the scary cat? Oh, my gosh. That is scary. <laughs> Looks like toothless. It just comes out of that. nowhere, and it's like it's exactly what it says. It's an ephemeral UI that just disappears in smoke. It's, it's nuts. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Illuma paper. This one seems like it has a uh, practical aspect. This is basically uh, interactive paper that lights up. Um, you know, provided the electronics get small enough, I can see, totally see this being useful for. Uh, they, they illustrate it being used in like tests and whatnot, um, so you can actually check your answers or whatnot. Uh, what do you guys think about this one? This one, this one, I thought was one of the more interesting ones. Oh, this has always been my complaint with e-textbooks and anything like that. Is it's so hard. To, like, I'm a big note writer in the margin. And you get to something that's, you know, a lot easier to take notes, but it's still provided in electronic format. And, you know, suddenly it's it's now actually viable. You know, this it's a comparable uh, a competitor with the, the paper products. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts on this one, Blake? Otherwise, I'm gonna... Yeah, I mean, I like the idea, um, but I wonder about sustainability of building it, right? Because now you're like, you're taking paper and now you're adding electronics to it. Like, bar they get thin enough and it makes, that would make plenty of sense. Um, it's cool. I think Elise makes a good point that it extends uh, some of the capabilities of e-readers now. Um, but still kind of, I'm kind of wary of the concept. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this last one here for interesting interfaces is uh, an emotion actuator, embodied emotional feedback through electro or EEG. Uh, and basically what it's doing is it's presenting. OK, so help me if I'm I'm saying this wrong, but uh, is it basically um, it reads your emotions through EEG and then stimulates your muscles to articulate some sort of gesture that corresponds with it? Well, okay, it's a little weirder than that. Is it so somebody else you, controlling it? Because that was my initial thought. Like somebody yeah, else controls you feel it. Their, you feel an emotion and then somebody else reciprocates some kind of uh, gesture to like, sh so that they're like show you that they're feeling that emotion that you're feeling. Okay. Yeah, that's that's what I thought it was initially, and I was like, wait, no, that's too out there. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, have we seen before? I, I'm pretty sure we've seen where somebody else is controlling somebody else's arm through, like, like they they read the muscle stimulation on one person, and then it controls the other person's arm. <laughs> have we seen that? 
I feel like we have, <laughs> but this is this is nuts because it's a little. It's like looking at how you're feeling and trying to translate it into a gesture, but not only a gesture, a gesture on somebody else's body. Yeah, I yeah, I always I don't know. I I think back to movies like Avatar where they where they talk about you know embodying this other being um, that is not you and you controlling it, and I <laughs> it kind of feels like that to me. <laughs> We're not far off, people. James Cameron's the the way of the future. <laughs> Most definitely, he'll be happy to have our endorsement. I'm sure. Oh my gosh! All right, any closing thoughts on this one, Elise? Before I move on to uh, virtual reality? No, not for me. Okay, so uh, they also did virtual reality. Um, uh, th- they also put together a list of virtual reality uh, interfaces, and these. Ugh, as okay, yeah, I'm just. Uh, so <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh man, some of these are just brutal. Okay, so <laughs> the first one, I don't even know if I can get through. <laughs> like, like, can you read these? I'm too busy over. Can you read these? <laughs> yes, I'll read these. I want to get your reaction anyway because you obviously have some strong feelings. Okay, so up first in the I triple so VR stupid. world is is the one, the only, the face display. So you're basically being enabled for multiple users to interact with one mo- virtual reality device. So picture your friend. He's got his Oculus on. And unlike watching people play video games, it's not very entertaining and not a whole lot of fun for you. So well, what do you do? You poke him in the face. The- <laughs> <laughs> if you strap some screens to the outside of Oculus, that's what this thing is. So your friends can watch you in VR on these screens outside of your headset. And it's also interactive. <laughs> so they're okay. The video shows other people poking this guy in the face as he's playing this game. It's so distracting and like, I don't know. I would hate this if I, I like the worst thing for me is when I'm in a virtual environment and uh, somebody in the environment that I'm not currently immersed in interacts with me in some way. It really takes me out of it. And so like to get somebody poking my face while I'm doing this. No, <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think this brings a whole new level to family game night. Oh, you know what? That's true. All right. Fair enough. All right. Let's get into this next one. So this next one is uh, fingertip tactile devices for virtual object manipulation and exploration. And this is we've seen something like this before. <clears throat> Not on the show. I don't think we've talked about it, but I've I've at least experienced. So they, they have like this um, sort of claw that will give you haptic feedback based on what you're touching in the virtual environment. And this operates in a very similar way if you were to pinch an object <clears throat> it gives you that feedback so that way you can't pinch anymore and it's like you're holding on to that object without the weight um in addition it kind of uh it has very fine motor control it's a little um uh, it's, a, it's a little cumbersome but obviously the idea here is that you'll be able to manipulate i uh smaller items in a virtual environment and i think th- something like this is uh very applicable to um, like something like telepresence where you have robotic or you have not robotic surgeons, but you have surgeons that are in uh, that are halfway across the world and while they're operating on somebody else. So uh, this to me is very useful, but I want to get your thoughts on it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's got a lot of use like you're saying, because I like the idea that now it's not just, okay, I'm feeling something, it's down to these very fine movements, like with your fingertips. Like you're saying, it's got, it's basically like a bunch of stuff on the top of your finger. Like it, it'd probably be, a, it'd probably be a lot of like extra weight and there's definitely some reiterations to be done over time. But I think the more and more that you can give this more of a true experience of interacting with your environment, the better people are going to adapt to VR versus like just holding controllers at the moment. Right. Uh, well, at least what do you think? I actually wanted to piggyback off of what Nick said about robotic surgery. I mean, having done research with it, one of the biggest drawbacks is that there is no haptic feedback currently, even when the surgeon's in the room. And the controls that they have are actually very similar to what's displayed in this video. And so, I mean, this just opens up the doors to to broaching that gap right now. Excellent. Well, that's something to look forward to. Uh, You guys take a lot of car rides. Do you guys go on like um, road trips or whatever? When was the last time? Every now and again, for sure, yeah. Yeah? Uh, Well, get ready for car VR. Uh, While one of you is driving, the other 
can uh, can sit in the passenger seat and play a VR experience <laughs> that maps on to the motions of the car. Basically, uh, you can play a game, and the game will respond to the car's movements as well as the uh, global optical flow rate that's happening on the outside of the car. So that way, they can be fully immersed with that extra sensation of G-Force. So, uh, I guess I guess time to play Forza. <laughs> <laughs> that would actually be really sick to do. Like, when you're in a car, it would just feel like you're actually driving. Oh, my God. Well, yeah, I mean, and a lot of it has to come down to that the game is actually mapping onto what the car is doing. So, something like Forza wouldn't, wouldn't work. You have to have something with free reign to where you can turn left, turn right. Um, but, yeah. I, well, I, one day. This is a step in the right direction, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. So I'm I'm mixed on this one. So, you know, there's some research that suggests if you have another person in the vehicle, uh you're you're less likely to get in an accident because you got an extra pair of eyes on stuff. Um, you know, it's different from talking on a cell phone where you could be completely distracted, but uh so if you ta- if you, you put this in there, you're taking somebody away from that and uh that could potentially be more distracting for the driver. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, this might be uh, like goofing off in the car, like pretending like they're driving. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna drive down. We're gonna get in the car and we're gonna go on a road trip and we'll hook up my PlayStation VR and everything will be good. All right, uh, what's up next? Uh, Ambo Ambiotherm. This is something that I have wanted for a very long time. So this is um, stimulating real world environmental conditions. So they'll basically blow a fan on you. Or um, heat your face up, depending on what you are experiencing in the environment, and it's just kind of an attachment that hooks onto the front uh, and uh, or back, front and back. It's both, and uh, and it is controlled uh, accordingly. And if you're if you're looking at this thing, like it's pretty cool. I- I'm down. Yeah, and it adds to the immersion factor. Like this, in combination with the different types of hacked feedback that we've seen, that I don't know, you're gonna just have better and better experiences as these kind of technologies get more integrated. Right, and well, yeah. Now that you say uh, haptic feedback again, too, uh, back to robotic surgery. Can you think about like how sweaty those doctors get in a virtual uh, headset? Like those things, after a while, get uncomfortable. And so, if you can like, you know, cool them off. Much like astronauts in a spacesuit, that could be something useful. Uh, any closing thoughts on this one? Otherwise, we'll uh, move on to the next. Okay, so providing yep. haptics, <laughs> <laughs> providing <laughs> haptics to walls and heavy objects in virtual reality by means of electric muscle stimulation. So this is basically, I think we talked about this on the show a couple weeks ago. Where uh, yeah, we've definitely broken this one down before because I remember I remember the video. Yeah, so they're they're. Uh, again, to remind our listeners, uh, first time listeners, hello, welcome. We always goof off. Uh, this is a basically a, a a rig that stimulates your muscles whenever you get close to a virtual wall. Um, we've talked about its stuff before. I think I think it's time to move on. We got a lot of stories, so uh, that was it for uh, Kai twenty seventeen. If you were there at Kai and want to let us know some interesting things that you found, please hit us up on Twitter or our Facebook group, or whatever. Uh, we're always down to listen to those stories. All right, Blake, let's go ahead and move on to the next story. What do we got? Most definitely. So a little more into VR. So over, the, over 100 million Americans suffer from chronic pain. And since the 90s, opioid prescriptions have tripled in the U.S., which is a country that pr- that consumes about 5% of the world's population, um, now responsible for consuming 80% of its opioids. It's clear we need an alternative and VR might offer a solution in a small clinical trial featuring 40 people, each receiving about 60 sessions of VR, all but one reported reduced pain. Overall patients reported 60 to 75% less pain than before VR sessions. And immediately following a single session, patients reported 30 to 50% less pain. As a comparison, morphine averages around a 30% pain reduction in uh, first time patients. So, Nick, I had heard or I had seen before like what they mentioned with this particular VR setting where it's uh, it's used to help get patients' minds off, that are burn victims, get their minds off of uh, wound cleaning sessions. And it's basically like 
immersing them in this kind of snowy world where they're uh, watching snowballs be thrown at. No, they're throwing the snowballs. Snowmen. Yeah, they're throwing the snowballs at pel- at uh, penguins and snowmen, and it's almost unbelievable that that this like little bit of immersion can just take your mind off of something that's got to be so painful. Yeah, it blows me away every time. <clears throat> it goes back to a statement I made a couple weeks ago on the show. I don't think the future of virtual reality is with gaming. And, uh, I mean, that's definitely going to be part, of, be part of it. But the main application is going to be stuff like this, where you have, um, y- you know, treating medical uh, <clears throat> conditions, where you have uh, sort of the mixed reality that Microsoft's going for, uh, you know, giving you instructional uh, instructions. Um, but yeah, I, I really like this. I think it's, I mean, the, the thing that really stands out to me is the stats here. Um, 60 to 75% less pain than before their VR sessions. And only one person was, uh, uh, you know, didn't, didn't report that. So, um, the, the other thing that's, that's astounding to me is that it's uh, it, it's almost just as effective as morphine, and w- without putting drugs in the body, you can do amazing things. I don't know. What do you think about this one, Elise? Because you did uh, healthcare human factors, so yeah. No, I mean, I I thought you made a great point, and the the movement moving forward in healthcare isn't just treating the disease; it's treating the whole person, and you know, this really brings in the psychological element with these profounding um stats and you know something that's very tangible this medication that we could administer as opposed to gaming and have them provide you know similar results is uh really promising moving forward yeah for sure uh any other closing thoughts on this one blake before we move on to the next story uh i guess the only like closing that i have is it's amazing that it's such a low fidelity for vr when this originated and the like steps that it's come this far like i can only imagine this being so much more effective now with like, as technology gets better and things get more hi-fi in VR. So awesome. I can't wait to see more. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, let's go ahead and move on to the next study story. All right. So story keeping study. it kind of in the healthcare realm. So according to a study condul- conducted through heartbeat measurement app cardiogram and the university of California, San Francisco, the Apple watch is 97% accurate in detecting the most common abnormal heart rhythm when paired with an AI based algorithm. So far, this study. So far, this is just a study built on a preliminary algorithm, but it holds promise in trying to identify and prevent stroke in the future. Now, Nick, we've gone over a good few stories in the past couple of weeks talking about identifying these different differences in heart rate to try and combat cardiovascular disease and stroke. And it's I like to see that Apple is actually coming ahead for this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like you said, we did mention this a couple times on the show where. Uh, we wonder. We wondered what the accuracy of these things were in trying to detect these, uh, and we've also mentioned sort of these notifications as well to um, to the wearers or the users, uh, so that way they're they're aware of their health. And and <clears throat> this study is promising because just based on this, they they mentioned it's a preliminary algorithm. Like this is very very basic, and so if they're able to cut, uh, they're, if they're able to um, correctly identify the most common uh, heart rhythm, then that's awesome. This is fantastic news. Uh, Elise, I, uh, I'm so glad we have you on the program for all these health <laughs> stories. Like, what are you thinking about this one? Um, I mean, it brings to mind a story I read not too long ago about a prototype bra that's coming out that is built with <laughs> technology that'll actually um, detect early stages of breast cancer. Um, you know, based off of algorithms related to body heat and, and, uh, you know, shape and, and such. And, um, it's just really interesting to see this trend of these wearables that are so transparent to people's lives. You know, it's not intrusive. It just, you know, seamlessly aligns with what people are already doing and, and helps them keep track of their health so much better because, you know, we have all the technology there and now it's about, seamlessly aligning it with what people are already doing in their really busy lives. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we actually talked about that bra on the show. I think if it's the same bra we're thinking of, 
<laughs> it could be. That's awesome. <laughs> um, uh, Blake, any other thoughts on this one? No, I just like seeing all of these. Like, because wearables are getting so much more popular. And, and later in one of the stories, we talk a little bit about how even aging populations are using them. So I feel like if this much data can constantly be collected and as just learning algorithms not only get better, but as the database gets that much bigger for comparison, I feel like we're going to see a host of these kind of issues be able to be identified early and end up saving a lot of lives just by having a wearable on. That's the hope. That's the hope. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right. So scientists dream of recreating mental images through brain scans, but current techniques produce results that are, well, fuzzy at best. So a trio of Chinese scientists, Chinese researchers might just solve that problem. They developed a neural network algorithm that can do a much better job of reproducing images taken from functional MRI scans. The system knows how to correlate voxels or 3D pixels in scans so that it can generate accurate noise-free images without having to see the original. This initial foray revolved around people staring at simple images, and there's much more work to be done before it's clear if this method if this method can be used for complex images and videos, but the breakthrough hints at a bright, if be it slightly creepy, uh, future for brain image recreation. Now, based off of some of the images they use in this article, and I encourage all listeners to take a look, it's pretty, I don't know, it's almost, it's as spot on as you can get as far as recognizing what a user who is looking at a screen to see like an image of a letter uh, being reproduced later on by this algorithm. So it's definitely moving in a right direction as, to, as far as clarity of what people are seeing in their head. Yeah, Elise, what do you think about this one? I want to get your thoughts. Um, it definitely brings us closer to that age-old question of, is the green that I see the green that you see? <laughs> yeah, I yeah, for sure. I This, ugh, I have so many mixed thoughts on this. Um. <laughs> this is cool and also scary. Like like you said, Blake. I think um the scariest part to me is is p- the potential for brain controlled devices, right? Uh and uh <clears throat> I mean, we talked about it on the show a couple weeks ago with the the whole Facebook thing wants to read your mind and convert your thoughts into um to text for messaging and whatnot. But I I I think this is one step towards that uh for higher fidelity at least and um yeah i i don't know i i'm 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 still really creeped out by the whole uh getting in my brain thing so uh, (laughs) that's my thoughts on it i don't really yeah well you can take solace in the fact that this is related to functional mri scan so it's going to take all it's going to take time to get to the point where it's some kind of wearable or scannable technology that you can walk around with but i do agree with you however they do make a good point at the end of the article about how this could help potentially doctors understand the mental issues that patients have. Like if you're somebody who sees hallucinations, maybe giving the doctor a frame of reference of what you're actually seeing. Um, so th- there could be medical benefits to it, but I don't know. I'm I, The first thing I thought of is what you brought up. I thought this is like a Facebook wearable in 10 years. Oh, yeah, for sure. Technology is definitely heading that way. All right, what do we got up next? More health stuff, right? Yeah, more health stuff. Yeah. So (laughs) if you're viewing your latest medical test results on your doctor's online portal, leaves you scratching your head and wondering whether to start planning for your 100th birthday bash or begin writing a will, you are certainly not not alone. So a computer-generated physician now under development explains diabetes and cholesterol test results to, pa- to would-be patients in videos designed for viewing on electric med- electronic medical record portals. The next step will to be obtain a grant to fund refinements to the design and possibly pi- a pilot study in which patients utilize the system through a provider's web portal. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've used a couple of different web portals for this specific instance of looking at my medical records. And I think this is a great idea because I often find myself confused. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I was going to say is I don't even go on there because the health data is so, how do I read this? What does that mean? And if I can have an AI telling me exactly what it means, then that's awesome. 
Uh, Elise, what are your thoughts on this one? No, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, how I've talked to my grandparents who are going in and out of the doctor's office, and they are so confused with a lot of the terminology that's thrown at them. If we can find a way to put this stuff in a way that's meaningful to people who haven't gone through years and years of medical school, and I'm all for it. Yeah, I imagine it's very similar to the way that we talk to someone about human factors. Like it's it's workflows and and uh, task diagrams and. And their uh, eyes glaze over. User ability. Yeah. And <laughs> Usability studies, user performance metrics, all that stuff. To us, it makes perfect sense, but to somebody else, it's like, what the hell? Uh, so, so yeah, anytime you can, you can definitely break down something for somebody else that doesn't speak that language, definitely going to be useful. Uh, we got a couple more stories. Let's try to rush through these. We're almost hitting the hour mark. Um, let's hit the next one. For Am sure. I, so... Uh, Worry about robots taking your job? Well, researchers say you are more, if you are more intelligent and who, all right, hold on. Sorry. Whoa. Let's try that again. <laughs> so worried about, ro worried robots will take your job. Researchers say people who are more intelligent and who showed an interest in the arts and sciences, dur arts and sciences during high school are less likely to fall victim to automation. That's pretty awesome. So work published this week in the European Journal of Personality suggests that personality traits, intelligence, and vocational interests are central to determining how well people will fare in the changing labor market. Now, for, I'm not going to try and toot our own horn, but since we will likely be involved in some of these issues, because it's a big human factors concern adding automation to the workplace, I feel like this is a good thing for us, especially uh, as the labor market continues to change but i think it's a good news for anybody else who wants to like strengthen skills uh for the future yeah we're pretty safe um at least i want to get your thoughts on this before i dive i am I'm, I'm, I'm gonna deep dive on this one <laughs> deep dive huh yeah um i mean this is the the main concern with a lot of jobs right now um but i i'm really curious to I mean, I didn't see a lot of detail about their tie with the arts and sciences. It was a unique twist for me because so many times we hear about the arts programs being cut and such. And um, I just found that really surprising. Okay, we ready? So <clears throat> what you got? Nick? <clears throat> so here's my thoughts on it. So uh, I've said before, what's the what's the answer to the question? What happens when robots take our job? Well, I think that we will move to a much more uh, we'll move to a society that's more concerned about with uh, uh, consumption and media consumption and um, specifically art consumption. Right. So uh, it, it makes sense to me that they mention arts in this. Right. Those who are interested in art will be able to publish something that robots cannot do. It is simply impossible for robots to recreate um, original pieces. That, I mean, now. Uh, but that means they're safe. And intellect, on the other hand, is uh, is staying ahead of that curve, right? You need intelligent people to stay ahead of that curve, to program computers, to do these things, to do these mundane jobs that don't require as much intelligence. And so all of this makes so much sense to me. And it, to me, these, these findings at least signal to me that we are trying to push ourselves um, in terms of our intellect towards a species where we can uh, take all these things and, and not have to do these manual labor jobs when everybody will have uh, an intellectually fulfilling uh, role in society. That's, that's kind of my thoughts on this whole thing. And please feel free to argue if I'm wrong or if you think I'm wrong. Who knows if I'm wrong? I don't know. I, I tend to agree with you. I think... I don't know. Maybe it's trying to be optimistic, right? So as we move towards this more automated type of society, and I, I know there will be points where people are struggling because they don't have a job, but hopefully if as things progress, like we can move back to being that more kind of craft made society where it is about like, I don't know, something as simple as the art of making handcrafted knives, like things that people, people really enjoy or making paintings or directing films. I mean, there there's a lot that automation can take over, but there's so much that makes us human and gives us those qualities of emotion that they won't be able to replace. 
Yeah. So I don't know. I think it's I think it's a, at the end of the day, it's scary and like changing labor market is a scary thought sometimes, uh, even for people who have been in been in like technology or anything like that. But ultimately, I think it could lead to good stuff. I yeah. hope so. And I think Nick, you brought up a good point. I mean, you answered my my art question, um, which is fantastic, but. I think that us as a society needs to also see that because currently, given the the trend in education, we're cutting a lot of these programs that are deeming us, quote unquote, unique from the automation. And if we don't look at the, the policies in place and the budgets in place, then, you know, our society can't support itself that way. Yeah, it's really hard to talk about this without getting into politics, but I, mean- I know. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're skirting it for sure. But yeah, policy is definitely going to be a big factor in this. And uh, the sooner we get policy in place that will encourage um, programs that allow children to be creative and uh, think about problems in a different way, mm-hmm. I, I I think, you know, it, we'll, we'll be there. We'll be there someday. I, I, I'm just I'm super optimistic about it, even though policy may not be there right now. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. All right, what do we got up next? <laughs> All right, so security can be a mixed bag. So where we once were limited to bad security practices of writing passwords on post notes, I know I'm guilty of that, some have taken this same mentality online. And as Troy Hunt points out, as Troy Hunt points out, Hunt shared a few tweets that illustrate how bad online security really is. In one case, when you visit a website, you have the option of selecting Express Checkout, where all you have to do is enter your email address and payment info to get things sent to you. Passwords are not required. And I'm I'm no real hacker here, but even I could figure out how to charge tons of Biosig Silk hair product to a random person's email address with that kind of security. Nick, like some of these tweets that Troy Hunt put out of security measures for websites were a little daunting and kind of scary that they haven't run into a bunch of lawsuits. Yeah, no kidding. Um, We didn't even talk about that, that uh, malware or ransomware. It was ransomware on Friday. We didn't even talk about that this week. Uh, If you're interested in that, go, go check out some articles. It's all over the internet. And if you were affected, you know exactly what it is. Um, Were either of you guys affected by that? The ransomware? No, I, I was not good. Uh, it was solved pretty quickly by accident, but um, <laughs> it essentially took over your computer. But these we're getting into that cybersecurity thing that I predicted at the beginning of the year where, um, you know, it, it just this is just one more example of, of those. I don't know. This this comes back to user experience as well. Um, and it's just like so like I'm looking at some of these questions and it's like. Uh, the, the or, or, or tweets, not questions. Uh, and and uh, one of them is an example of somebody putting in a password, and it's it flat out says, you know, this password is being used by another user, with and it gives the user's name. So you yeah, can, that one was particularly incredible. Because yeah, so you can actually like see the username, type in the username, and you know the password because you just put it in. So. There's that. And then another one was uh, the security question on this one site was, uh, uh, what is the capital of California? Okay, because not everybody knows that. It's not personal to the person. (laughs) To be uh, fair, Sacramento is very hard to spell. Okay. All right. (laughs) I don't know. I'm going to play devil's advocate on this. I think passwords are terrible. I mean, we're, our cognitive resources are not designed to remember these arbitrary strings that are, you know, 14 characters long, and there's always a different requirement on each website. I mean, if we don't figure out a better way to maintain security, it's, we're going to continue to have these like terrible methods for trying to track this kind of stuff. Well, they've been, so, so to, to combat that, yes, no, we are not equipped to do that. And so there are ways that we've been trying to get around it, such as like two-factor authentication, where uh, when you try to log in, it'll send a it'll send a text to your phone, and you have to type in that number, right? And that number is randomly generated, and that number, um, presumably, only you can access because it's sent to your phone. There are also authenticator applications that will 
generate these random codes and that aspect of it is random and you have to know your password and you have access you have to have access to the code in order to get in this is just highlighting some of those security flaws that you know is seen uh, throughout the web um it's just shocking to me just shocking yeah i mean some of them i think they would have they just should have had like a qa test that was a little more serious. I mean, like for the one that shows you in the tooltip, like, Hey, this is being used by X user. Uh, <laughs> that that's just, I think that's more like small potato flaw things, but I don't know. Some of these were a little bit scary, but uh, to kind of, I guess, piggyback on what you're saying. I mean, we, there are a lot of applications that exist out there like LastPass that help you with these kind of password related issues. Uh, but even, even with that, I still see people with like spreadsheets full of passwords for all their accounts. So we've got to come to some kind of head with this stuff. Yeah. You should have seen it when I was applying to grad school. I had a spreadsheet of the institution, my username, my password, because it was all different for everyone, you know, and then like my status, obviously of how, <clears throat> how far along I was with submitting my materials. But, um, but yeah, these password management systems, they, they, I saw a really cool, I want to get your thoughts on this one. I, I saw a really cool idea for a password um, alternative where it was basically a ring and you have kind of like an NFC reader on your computer and you just tap your ring to it. Presumably no one else has their ring, um, you know, unless they chop your finger off and use that. But I mean... It's the same. Or you take your ring off to wash your hands and <laughs> then forget to put it back on. Yeah, but presumably, you know, it's so important that you'd want it with you all the time. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I like I liked that idea, and I like that they're thinking outside the box with these things. I don't think that went anywhere um, because of other problems, but okay. Uh, I think things like that have, like, pretty good merit, though, because the more you can make wearables like fashion sensitive like like it's a ring it's not just like some brace that goes in your arm with a bunch of sensors i feel like you're gonna have more people adopt it and be you'd be better off having a lot more adopters and then it would work out um, versus like a slow margin of people even wanting to try it out because it's like cumbersome yeah i get you all right let's move on to this next one because we're almost bumping up against the hour here but uh it's okay if we run over a little bit this one is really all right oh shit so this one is really good (laughs) Uh, Nick, I feel like you'd be excited about this one. But anyway, so if you want to set up a connected home, you've got two options. You can buy a bunch of smart gadgets that may or may not communicate with other smart gadgets, or you can retrofit all your appliances with sensor tags, creating a splash dash network. The first is pretty expensive, and the second is just a hassle. But before long, though, you might have a third choice, one simple device that plugs into an electrical outlet and connects everything in the room. Synthetic Sensors, a Carnegie Mellon University project that promises to make creating a smart, context-aware home a snap, can can capture all of the environmental data needed to transform a wide variety of ordinary household objects into smart devices. The aggregation of these signals result in a computer algorithm analyzing what state your home is in. So, for example, it can detect changes in signals if your faucet is running. So... This is great because it's a singular thing that is, I guess, basically building an algorithm about your house through collecting just sensor data all the time, which is amazing. Yeah. Uh, if you look at some of the examples he shows, it's like he does the faucet. He also does the fireplace. And the idea is that the um, the disruption in the uh, – presumably it uses something like echolocation or, uh, you know, it sends out signals and receives them back. And then the changes will um, – will will inform the application what is going on in the environment right so it's it's going to be hard to deduce that uh it, the faucet is running unless it has a database full with data of what a faucet running looks like so they train it through machine learning and then boom you suddenly have uh an application that understands what a running faucet looks like in the home I think this is really cool because I worked on a project where they were doing something similar <clears throat> in terms of um, uh, it was electrical uh, consumption in the home. So you could tell which devices were using the most electricity based on um, uh, electrical data coming from the home. And this is this is something very similar. It's just in, in the sense of uh, of the environment. So it's it's all really cool to me. I love this stuff. 
Elise, what did you think about this one? I definitely think it's interesting. I mean, I go to three different websites to try and figure out how much gas, water, and electricity I'm using. So um, again, it goes back to my point earlier, any way that we can make <clears throat> this technology as transparent to people, um, the better. I mean, this kind of gets at the the remote control problem back in the day where you had five different remotes and then it was consolidated in one. I mean, here tracking all your, your home data in, in one place, I think is really helpful. It scares me a little bit to have all that information being tracked, but um, could be helpful if used for the right things. See, I always argue that it's a, it's a trade-off, right? So you surrender that um, privacy with being tracked for the convenience and I'm okay with it. Speaking of, Multi remotes. I just have to say, I finally hooked up my Logitech Harmony again, and now when I go to bed, I can just say, "Alexa, turn everything off," and she literally turns off my TV, my PlayStation Four, all my lights, and s- turns on my nightlight next to my bed. It's so wonderful to just have my <laughs> life automated like that. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, on that note, uh, do you guys have any other closing thoughts on this one? I do not. I'm good. All right. Well, then let's get out of here. Um, that's going to be it for today everyone if you have any questions or topics or any news stories that you think we missed you can follow us on social media head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn, Facebook or Twitter at H Factors Podcast join the discussion on our SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com if you're feeling saucy leave us a voicemail we love to hear from you at 901-646-1432 that's 901-646-1HFC. You can also support our Patreon. You know, we bring these things to you ad-free because we love you at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, leave us a good review on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or your favorite podcast directory. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank my panel for being here on the show today. Elise Hallett, where can they find you? They can find me on LinkedIn. Excellent. And Blake Arnsdorf. Mr. Director Arnstorf, where can our listeners find you? Oh, you guys can find me on the Twitters, as always, at Don't Panic UX. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, at least we sign off by saying it depends. Can you say it depends with us? Sure. It depends. It depends. It depends. <laughs> so, so much. And if your home is smarter than Depending, depending.